Well, greetings, my name is Lucas Mann and I'm the pastor of the Spring Church in Lawrence, South Carolina. And I come out here this evening to bring to you the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the good news of, of the Son of God, that He came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost, that Christ Jesus is a sufficient Savior, a powerful Savior, a broad-shouldered Savior. And uh, as He Himself said, the one who comes to Him, He will by no means cast out. And friends, I'm here to warn you about sin, to warn you about the impending wrath of God, that God's wrath is going to consume His enemies. That just as the flood in the days of Noah, those thousands of years ago, destroyed most of the life on earth, so too one day will the wrath of God destroy the wicked. But just as, as God pre prepared an ark that Noah and his family might be saved from the flood, so too has the ark of salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ, appeared to save sinners from the wrath which is to come. And so there is an offer that is being brought forth this evening, and it is the offer of the gospel, the free offer of life, that it costs you nothing, it costs the sinner nothing, but simply to embrace Christ. As uh, Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, he said, For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is only by believing that God is gracious enough to save sinners, which He certainly is, are we saved. It is believing that the grace of God, as Paul says in Titus 2, has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly and righteously and godly in the present age. Friends, Christ Jesus came into the world to take away sin in His first advent. But in His second coming, He's coming to bring judgment against those who have rejected the God who has revealed Himself unto them. Friends, the offer of the Gospel is free. And it is the Gospel I seek to make known this evening. To make known the bad news and then to bring the glorious Gospel of grace to, to light that you might believe it and be saved. That you might enter the kingdom of God. For the Lord Jesus said in John 3.3 3, that unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And so friends, it is my plea with you tonight. It is my desire that you would repent and believe the gospel. That you would turn from your sins, your, your drunkenness, your selfishness, your pride, your hatred, your worldliness. And that you would flee to the Lord Jesus Christ. As the psalm says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run into it and are safe. And ultimately, I'm out here to exalt the God who has authored the Gospel, who has brought about the Gospel of grace. For this is not something that the, the wisdom of man has invented. This is not something that has sprung forth out of the mind of man. This has come from the very mind of God. The Gospel comes forth from God Himself. And so to preach it is to glorify Him. To bring forth the message of the cross is to glorify the God who died upon that cross, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so ultimately, that's my desire, is to bring glory to the God of glory by preaching the Gospel of His Son to a lost and dying world. So, at the outside, I will say, to God be glory, and to God be the glory as the Gospel is preached this evening. Now, the text of Scripture that I would like to direct your attention to is found in Romans chapter 3. In verse 19, Romans 3.19, Paul here is writing to the Christians at Rome and he writes these words. It's a very simple, very short verse. He simply says this, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Friends, this text speaks to the reality that every mouth is closed before God. That every person is found on this equal plane before the Creator. This equal plane of lostness, of enmity with God, of a wrong standing with God. 
that there are none who stand on a neutral plane or stand on neutral ground with the Lord Jesus Christ. He Himself said, you are either for me or you are against me. There is no neutrality with Christ. That's why the Gospel demands response. It demands that the sinner flee and embrace Christ because they are not in a neutral position. They are in a position of enmity. And I myself and you, all mankind, are in this state. This isn't just for some particular group of people or some particular group of people from a particular background in society. It's not just the poor or the rich or the black or the white. It is all people. Every mouth. That's why Paul says, every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. It's clear and it's thorough from this text that here is where we stand. We stand in this position of enmity with God. It is not something that after we were born we found ourselves wiggled into. It is something which we were born in and we inherited from Adam, the federal head of the human race. Adam was put in the garden in perfect communion with God and God told Adam simply not to eat the forbidden fruit that was of the tree in the middle of the garden. But what happened? Adam fell. And Adam failed the test. He failed this probationary period. And so therefore, all mankind, all of humanity fell in Him. And that is why when we are born, we are, as the psalmist wrote in Psalm 51, we are born in sin. And so ultimately, the man, the Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man, had to come down and save sinners. That's why Jesus Himself said in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus said, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It is not those who are well, but those who are ill that need a physician. They need the great physician. The one who can raise spiritually dead sinners to spiritual life. And praise be to God that the Lord Jesus Christ is in that business of raising dead people to life. Because friends, if you are right now not in Christ, not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you're dead in sin, as Ephesians 2.1 says totally incapable of reacting to spiritual stimuli. And the only way that you can be taken out of this position of deadness and sin is if God raises you to spiritual life. That's what the Bible describes as being born again. Friends, you must be born of the Holy Spirit. You must be born from above. And it is something only God can do in a man. It is something only God can do in his heart. It's not necessarily about the outward extremities that certainly will come and that certainly has its place but the thank you sir but it is the inward parts it is the heart my friends God is after changing hearts in the new covenant in fact uh, you right now if you don't know Christ you have a heart of stone and one of the promises of the new covenant as God promised through the prophet Ezekiel was that God would take hearts of stone and change them into hearts of flesh so it's a miracle it's literally a miracle Scripture uses the term regeneration. That is that God recreates the man. He takes the old man and makes him literally new. Polar opposite of what he once was. And friends, that's what's necessary for salvation. That's how lost man truly is. And I cannot stress this enough that this is not the state of a simple few. This is the state of all of us. Every last one of us, friends. That's why the command is the same to all people in all places. As the Scripture says in the book of Acts, God commands all men everywhere to repent. And so even though therefore we are in this state of lostness, praise be to God that Christ Jesus came into the world to rescue lost sinners through His perfect life, through His perfect obedience, And then through His death upon the cross, by propitiating the wrath of God against the sins of the people of God, ultimately in His resurrection and His ascension after 40 days. And it is ultimately that gospel I seek to make known to you this evening. I want to consider the truth I've just mentioned. 
about our universal lostness as corporately as the human race, but ultimately I want that to guide us and lead us, as it were, to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so before we consider those truths, though, I'd like to consider the context of this verse. Romans 3.19 here. Where has Paul come from? Where is he going? In, in, this, in this letter he is writing to the church at Rome. Yes, sir. You remember that, right? Yes, sir. I remember, I remember speaking with you. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to get something. Yeah, I, 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 I didn't bring any. I didn't bring anything with me this time. I apologize. I, I did tell you. I try to remember to bring a snack or something in case I get hungry or someone if you ask. And I didn't even bring water. I actually forgot to bring water bottles. I don't have anything to drink either for myself. But um, I think my friends have already spoken with you and, and told you about there's some places near here that will help you. Yeah. Churches and ministries. There, there more. There, there's a super abundant amount of places in this area that are willing to help you. Let me hold you up. Okay, okay. You have a good evening. God bless you. And so, friends, here in this chapter of Romans 3, Paul is describing the lost state of man. He actually starts in verse 10 uh, by quoting the Old Testament as the basis for his apostolic teaching. And he says, There is none righteous, there is not even one, there is none who understands, there is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. And the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And that brings us to the doorstep of verse 19. So Paul is clear here. He's very thorough. And it's very it's a hopeless situation. The state of man. And and as I said, Paul is so, so clear. He doesn't leave any room for speculation. Will you shut up? In fact, we find these parallels Go here in, in these in verse Go 10 and 11. Away. He says, There is none Go righteous. Away. And then not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. There is none, there is none, there is none. It says it three times. The parallel is very strong. It's because he wants the reader to understand this, that it is universal. But praise be to God that Christ died for sinners without exception. As Scripture says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. Friends, Christ came into the world to redeem lost sinners. Even though we are vile wretches, even though we are lost sinners in our state of, of lostness, your state of lostness is so great, Christ is a greater Savior. And then in the few, um, even in the next verse, in verse 20, he speaks of the fact that no man can justify himself by his works, by the works of the law. No man can by his own performance, by his own good deeds, by his own religiosity, reconcile himself to God. My friends, you cannot be good enough to enter the kingdom of God. The Lord Jesus said, you must be born again. It is something God gives man, not man gives to God. My friend, salvation is not like a job. It's not something that we put in the, the work and then therefore receive wages for it. Salvation is not wages for work. It is a gift of grace. It's not a reward for the righteous, but a gift for the guilty. That's the essence of salvation. And gloriously, Paul actually says in the next couple of verses, verse 21, he says, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. So notice what Paul says. The way of salvation is by faith receiving the righteousness of Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith to the sinner's account. It's trusting in the performance, the perfection, the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And then he even says in verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now notice verse 24, being justified, that is declared righteous, as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. So even though Paul, and in specifically in this verse that we're looking at, verse 19, and in the previous verses, has been thorough in his covering of the bad news, it is so that he might bring the sinner to the glories of the good news. And that's because any skillful doctor first explains to his patients the illnesses that they are beset with so that he can give them the cures and the treatment options. He doesn't first tell them how they can be cured of the diseases that they are ignorant of them having. He first explains to them how ill they are. Perhaps even if it's a deadly disease, how, how grim the, the, the consequences of that illness might be. And therefore, when he presents to them treatment options, they're going to be more than willing to grab hold of it. And so Paul is a skillful spiritual physician, we could say is explaining to the reader his lost state so that the reader might grab hold of Christ and might cling to Him. So therefore, let's zoom in on verse 19, which, I, as I said, speaks to the fact that all mouths are closed before the Holy One. He says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. Now we ask ourselves, who are those who are under God's law? Well, we know from the next phrase who that is. So that every mouth, and then a little later he says, and all the world. So it is every person without exception, without distinction, is under the law of God. We are under the condemnation of God's law. You may say, listen, I've never even heard of the Bible, never even heard of God's law. How can I be under it? Friends, God has not only revealed His holy character in His Word to us, but even in general revelation. That is, that God has given you a conscience. You know what is right from wrong. No one has to tell you that. You know it. It's inherent. It's built in. Cultures all around the world, for the most part, on, on very basic things, agree unanimously on morality. Murdering is wrong. Thievery is wrong. Adultery is wrong. Why is that? Because man has an inherent sense of what is right and what is wrong. And God has built that into him. And so even when the person who knows not of Scripture, knows not of the God of glory, sins, they are still sinning. They are still rebelling against that which they know to be true. And the God who has revealed Himself to them in nature. So that men are without excuse, God has revealed Himself. In fact, that's exactly what Paul says in chapter 1 of this very book. He says in verse 18 of chapter 1, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. So, it's very, very clear from the testimony of Scripture and what we find in the world in which we live that man has an inherent sense of the God who has made him. Certainly that, that knowledge that man has intrinsically is not sufficient for salvation. That is why God had to reveal Himself in Holy Scripture. But it is enough to get us without excuse, to put us in a state where we are without excuse. And so, friends, even if you have never heard of the God of glory, you are without excuse, and your soul is tainted by sin, and the only way you can be cleansed is by the power of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And even if you know about Scripture, then certainly you have more guilt and more condemnation upon you, because you, having the light of God's revelation, still have sinned against it. And so, friends, you are more guilty, and you need salvation, which is only possible and available through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the call to the pagan, the call to the religious is the same. Repent and believe the gospel. That's why Paul said in, in Romans cha uh, chapter 1, the same chapter I just read from in verse 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. For everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And Paul said that would have been the religious and the non-religious because the same gospel saves both. But going back to chapter 3, verse 19, he says, So that every mouth may be closed 
and all the world may become accountable to God. Notice that every mouth may be closed. In other words, there's no excuse. There's nothing you can bring before God and say, God, I didn't know. And even think about this tonight, my friends. God in His divine providence and in His, in His glorious sovereignty, which spans all things, has appointed that I come out here this evening and you hear some of the preaching from the Word of God. And therefore, you are even more without excuse. Those who have more light are held more accountable. Those who have more truth are held more accountable by God. And so, friends, the plea becomes even more urgent. Your trust must be in Christ alone. In the fact that Christ accomplished a redemptive work at that cross. That He bought salvation by His own blood upon the cross of Calvary. And then he says, and all the world may become accountable to God. My friends, the things which you do in secret, the evil things which you commit, the evil sins that you commit, the sexual immorality that you engage in on Friday nights, the drunkenness, the, the, the drunken stupor that you put yourself in, or perhaps those prideful thoughts those hateful thoughts that enter into your mind, those materialistic and greedy desires of your heart, God takes notice of, friends. God has taken notice of them. And you will become accountable to Him for those things. Or your trust can be in the fact that Christ already took ownership of your sin upon the cross. That's what the cross is. Jesus Christ takes ownership of the sins of the elect, of the sins of the people of God, so that God might forgive His people. See, God just cannot arbitrarily forgive sin. He just can't sweep it under the rug and say, okay, that's okay. I'll just let it pass. There has to be just a punishment. There's got to be a penalty. There's got to be payment. You wouldn't walk into a store and just steal some merchandise. There has to be payment. You've got to buy the item that you take for your possession. So it is for Christ's bride, the church. Christ loves His bride. He loves His people. But He had to buy her out of slavery to sin. He had to buy her from her slavery to the fear of death, as Hebrews tells us. So that all the world may become accountable to God. What a powerful passage of Scripture, friends. That every person without distinction, without exception, will become accountable to God. And the only way we can escape that ultimate judgment is as John 3.18 says, He who believes in Him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So friends, the only way we can escape this, this being held accountable by God, being judged by God, ultimately being lost in hell forever, is trusting in the fact that Christ bore the wrath of God against us and our sin. That the Father loved His people so much that He sent His Son into the world and died for them. And ultimately rose again three days later. Christ is alive today. And as the book of Hebrews tells us, never will He die again. Well, we ask ourselves as we find that last word there of verse 19, the word God, that's one of the most basic concepts. Who is the God of glory? Who is the God of Scripture? Who is the God who has made us and made all things and for whose glory all things have been made? Well, He is the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one in three and three in one. One being in essence and nature, and that being essence and nature shared by three eternal, coexistent persons, the Blessed Trinity, the Holy One of Israel. God is so holy, my friends. So, so very holy. In fact, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6 has a heavenly vision of God and he is granted a great privilege to stand in glory and see God seated on His throne and see the angels in glory there. And this is what Isaiah records the angels saying to one another as they're beholding the glory of God. In verse 3 of Isaiah 6, he writes, he quotes these angels by saying, Holy, 
Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Friends, God is so holy. He is set apart from that which is perverse and wicked. Sanctified is He. Holy is the one of the Holy One of Israel, the God of glory, the God of creation, the God who has made you and me. He is also just and righteous. As we saw there in Romans 3, as I read just a few moments ago, how God gives to the sinner righteousness. Where does that come from? That's God Himself. That comes from God. God is righteous in all His ways. The root of the word righteous is right. In other words, He does rightly. He always does what is right. He Himself, by His own intrinsic character, defines what is right. So holy, so just, and so righteous is He. In fact, it is beyond our greatest comprehension. It is beyond what we could possibly imagine. I love what the psalmist said. He said, How precious are your thoughts to me, O Lord! How vast is the sum of them! Indeed, how great is the God of glory! It is true that God is gracious and compassionate. I think that we can all testify just by the things we've seen in our own lives, the grace of God holding back from us that which we deserve. We think about the mercy of God in holding us back from the pit of hell, burning there eternally, tormented for our sin. God has kept us from that. Even you yourself, you who are outside of Christ, you who know not the Lord Jesus Christ, are even right now spared from hell's torments because of the mercy of God. But however, that never negates the holiness of God. God's love does never, it never negates God's holiness. In fact, we find in, what do we find in 1 John 4.8? The text simply says, God is love, and that is certainly true. Certainly that is true. And as I said, we see that in it, even in our own lives. But again, my friends, I must stress this. That never negates God's holiness or His justice. So we know that the God, being, the God of glory being so holy and just must deal with sin and must deal with the sinner. His wrath is kindled against the wicked. But however, as we're going to see in a moment... In His love, He provided atonement in His Son. There is a sense in which God has a generic love toward all people, but He does not love all salvifically. God does not have a love for all people salvifically. The atonement of Christ was not designed for all people without exception. Or, excuse me, all people, every person on the face of the earth, it was for a, a certain people. Those whom the Father in eternity past chose to set His love upon. We'll, we'll, we'll see that in just a moment. But Psalm 98.9 says, it says concerning God, He is coming to judge the earth. There we see again the justice of God revealed unto us. So friends, God in His perfect character, in His goodness, and when I say goodness, I mean His, his moral faculties, not His disposition. His disposition toward the wicked, and, and even in their own lives, is good. He deals with them very graciously, but I'm speaking specifically of His moral faculties, that God is perfect, morally good. In that, God has given His law, His Ten Commandments, the Holy Law of God, as they are found in Exodus chapter 20 where God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses on top of Mount Sinai. The glory of God appeared there. The Israelites were so fearful because of the glory of God. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The God that is talked about in many churches here in, in Greenville County is not the God of the Bible. He's a false God, an idol. A God that suits people's own lust and desires. A genie in a bottle, you could say. A cosmic grandfather in the sky. The God of Scripture, the God of glory, is a holy God. And even Isaiah, one of the most holy men in his day, going back to that text I just read, I could have read on, and Isaiah actually says when he sees the Lord's glory, he says, Woe is me! 
for I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And this man was holy. He served God, and yet he stands in God's presence, and he's fearful. He's, he's struck with terror. That's because to stand before God is a fearful thing. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So concerning His law, concerning God's Ten Commandments, His moral law, those spring forth out of His character, out of His holy character. So when we read, for example, God says in verse 3 of Exodus 20, He says, You shall have no other gods before Me. Down a little further, verse 12, Honor your father and mother. Verse 13, you shall not murder. Verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. Verse 15, you shall not steal. Verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. These commands show us the character of God. You could consider God's law and you could contemplate it as a mirror. A mirror which reflects unto us the beautiful image of God's character. God's law is not something that ought to be dreaded. It's not something that is, oh man, it's just annoying. It's glorious that the psalmist talks about his delight being in the law of the Lord. So we find in verse 3, when God commands the Israelites not to commit idolatry, it's because God is a jealous God, jealous for His people, for their worship, and they're following after Him. Verse 12, Honor your father and mother. That again is in accordance with the character of God. Verse 13, You shall not murder. God is not a murderous God, therefore He commands people not to murder. Verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. Why does God not uh, desire for spouses to be faithful to one another? Because God is a faithful, covenant-keeping God. Never fails to keep His promises. You shall not steal. God owns all things. He has the prerogative, the divine prerogative, to tell us what we ought to do with that which He ultimately owns. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. In other words, you shall not lie. Why does God command that? The book of Hebrews tells us it is an impossibility for God to lie. God in His character cannot lie. It is repulsive to Him. And therefore He commands we not lie. That's not the issue. The law of God is not the issue. The character of God as it is revealed in the law of God is not the issue. The issue comes when it is on us. When we consider us in relation to the God of glory and the law of God, because we find that we ourselves cannot keep it, and that we trample it underfoot, that we have broken it, and that you have spat upon it and desecrated it, and you have the wrath of God abiding upon you at this present time. That's why my plead is, uh, my friends, and I call you that because I care for you, it, my plead with you is that you would find hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's hopelessness outside of Christ. You're simply awaiting the, the justice of God, the holy wrath of God to be unleashed upon you eternally. Or, you can flee to Christ as your hope and have the full assurance that you're your, your inheritance is sealed. Your entrance into glory is sealed because Christ has satisfied the wrath of God against sin. And He has fulfilled the law's requirements and His righteousness is given to those who believe in Him. So though you are in a hopeless state, there is hope in the Lord Christ. So we find ourselves, verse 3 of Exodus 20, You shall have no other gods before me. If you've ever worshipped anything besides the true God, or any other false god, that's idolatry, and it's offensive to God. Honor your father and mother. If you've ever disrespected your parents, dishonored them, you've sinned against God, you shall not murder. You know, you say, I've never murdered anybody, but the Lord Jesus Christ said, and in Matthew 5, that if you have anger in your heart, a hatred, and, in, and um, John writes about this in 1 John as well, if you have hatred in your heart towards someone, it's equated with murder. God sees it as the same thing. God sees it as the exact same thing, my friends. Verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. You say again, I've been faithful to my spouse. The Lord Christ said in Matthew 5, He said, If any man looks at a woman with lust for her, he commits adultery already with her in his heart. And certainly that goes for women as well. Friends, God sees the mind. He sees the heart. 
He sees that it is wicked and perverse. He doesn't see inherent goodness. Don't be so prideful, friends, so as to think that your heart is intrinsically good. My heart is not. I know that the heart that I have, or once had, I should say, was corrupt to the core. And that's why the promise of the new covenant had to be given, that God would take out the heart of stone, the heart of enmity with Him, and would replace it with a heart of flesh. Jeremiah 17.9 says, The heart is more deceitful than all else, and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? It is beyond fathoming how bad man truly is. How lost his state truly is outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is bad. We have broken God's law. And we must admit it. We must admit simply that which we know to be true. You shall not steal. Have you ever stolen? My friends, God will punish thieves. He will punish those who steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not lie. If you've ever lied, the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation that all liars will have their place in the lake of fire. You need forgiveness. You need divine forgiveness, friends. Through Christ Jesus. And so therefore, we all of us, as we found there in Romans 3, have broken God's law, have trampled His commands underfoot, and therefore we find ourselves as sinners in the hands of an angry God. Sinners before the Most High. And He holds us accountable, as Paul uses that term there in Romans 3, 19. That we are held accountable before God for our sin. For our law-breaking and just as a rapist and a murderer here in, in Greenville County deserves to be thrown into prison for their law breaking, so too it is with God. When we trample His law underfoot, when we break His commands, do we deserve punishment? It is only just for God to do so. It is only in accordance with the perfect character of God for He Himself to do that. And He does indeed. Nahum 1 tells us this. Nahum 1, 2 says, A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on His adversaries, and He reserves wrath for His enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In a whirlwind and storm is His way, and clouds are the dust beneath His feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Caramel wither. The blossoms of Lebanon wither. Mountains quake because of Him, and the hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved at his, by His presence, the world and all the inhabitants in it. Who can stand before His indignation? Who can endure the burning of His anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken up by Him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and He knows those who take refuge in Him. But with an overwhelming flood, He will make a complete end of its sight and will pursue His enemies into darkness. So this text clearly reveals to us the holiness of God, the just judgment of God that we deserve upon each and every one of us that as Nahum wrote, we deserve to be chased into darkness by God, which is ultimately the darkness of hell. The Lord Jesus Christ spoke more of this place than He did about heaven. The place that He described as the place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. The place of outer darkness. The place where some are beat with many stripes and some with few. The place of an unquenchable flame where the worm does not die. Hell is not a place, my friends, that I want you to go. That's why I'm out here. To, to call out to you to flee the wrath of God which is to come. Don't lose your soul for your sins. Don't lose your soul eternally for your rebellion against God. Instead, my friends, know the Lord. Know that He is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. And He takes, he takes notice of those who take refuge in Him. He knows those 
who take refuge in Him. Matthew 25, 46, the Lord Jesus says this concerning hell. He says, and this is speaking of the wicked, these will go away into eternal punishment. Hell is not just a simple period of time. It's eternal. It's eternal, my friends. A place where God is rendering unto the wicked His just wrath against them. And why is hell eternal, friends? Because God is an infinite God, an infinitely holy God. And when we offend in an infinitely holy God, we bring about an infinite judgment upon ourselves. Infinite wrath revealed from heaven. And as Paul says there in Romans 3.20, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in His sight. In other words, we are in this fearful state where we are simply awaiting the final judgment when we will be thrown into hell. And we cannot work our way out of this. We cannot, as it were, build a ladder to climb ourselves out of this ditch. Its depth is too deep. It takes divine accomplishment. There are only two religions in the world. Human achievement, human accomplishment, and divine accomplishment. And only one truly brings about salvation. Only one truly brings souls unto glory. And it is divine accomplishment. It is God condescending to save sinners. And so there is no amount of good deeds that you can do to reconcile your lost soul to God. There is no amount of righteousness we can offer up to God because as Isaiah says in Isaiah 64 verse 6, even our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. God's offended when we try and offer up some, some sort of uh, good performance to try and placate Him. To try and convince Him to let us off the hook. I mean, imagine that in a court of law. Imagine a convicted murderer trying to convince a judge to let him off the hook because he's done good things in his life. It doesn't work. The guilt is still there. Good deeds are good to do, but they're not going to justify you. And in fact, it just brings more guilt upon you because God is more offended. It's more disrespectful unto God. It's prideful. It's thinking that we are more than what we truly are. We are lost, hopeless wretches. Nothing more. And so therefore, we are truly hopeless. I love the way the London Baptist Confession speaks of the Gospel and how the Gospel begins. It begins with God Himself and His grace condescending, condescending to save the sinner. Because even though we are in this hopeless state, this state of, of hopelessness, true hopelessness, the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ brings hope to hopeless sinners. The London Baptist Confession, chapter 7, paragraph 1, puts it like this. It says, The distance between God and the creature is so great that although reasonable creatures do owe obedience to Him as their Creator, yet they could never have attained the reward of life by some voluntary condescension, or excuse me, but by some voluntary condescension on God's part, which He hath been pleased to express by way of covenant. And that is the covenant of grace, my friends. The new covenant. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. My friends, in eternity past, the Father, with such a great love for His people, with such a great amount of grace, a bounty of grace toward His elect, he set them apart from glory. As, as Ephesians 1 says, He predestined them to life. Predestined them unto salvation. And covenanted with the Son. See, this new covenant, the covenant of grace, springs forth from the covenant transaction that took place between the members of the Trinity. That the Father commissioned the Lord Jesus Christ in eternity past to come in to space and time, to live a perfect life, to die for the elect, to, to be raised on the third day. And He would therefore give Him the full reward of His sufferings. He would exalt Him to His right hand in glory. And Christ agreed to this, to this charge, to this compact, Christ agreed. Even the Holy Spirit joined in on this and agreed to equip Christ to do what He did in His perfect life and then to apply the benefit of His work to the hearts of the elect. 
And so, my friends, 2,000 years ago, around that time, the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, the eternal God, came down and took upon Himself human flesh. He veiled His glory. He was born of a virgin. He was born under the law, as Paul says in Galatians 4.4. 4. And He came... And in His perfect life, He fulfilled the law of God. He fulfilled the perfect commands that God gave for us to obey. So the Ten Commandments, as I referenced earlier, those commands which we certainly have not kept, but have done the opposite of, Christ comes in as the perfect man, as the God-man, as the, the last Adam, the second Adam. And He keeps the law of God on behalf of the people of God. That's why Jesus Himself said in Matthew 5 at the beginning of His ministry, verse 17, He said, Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Christ came to live in perfect submission and obedience to the law of God. And He fulfilled it, friends. Christ fulfilled it in His power, by His own power, by His might and His strength. He fulfilled it. Away with the false Christ that is spoken of in churches in this county. A weak Jesus, a feminized Jesus. The Jesus of Scripture is strong, broad-shouldered, manly. He's a strong Savior. And He came and fulfilled the law of God perfectly. And it is this Christ you must be reconciled to. You must embrace this Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, if you're not in Christ, you're in condemnation. Paul himself said in Romans 8.1, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That text clearly implies that if you are outside of Christ, then you are in condemnation. You are under the wrath of God. Friends, that's why the, the, the call of the Gospel is so urgent. Because your soul is at stake. At any moment your life could be taken from you. 150,000 people every day die. And most go to hell. Jesus said, many are on the road to destruction. And only few will be saved. You ask, how do I know that I'm amongst that few? Embrace the Lord Jesus Christ, then you'll know. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, and then you'll know. Salvation is so simple. It truly is. Because it is a miracle of God. It is something God does in man. Not man toward God. And friends, to speak of the peak of Jesus' humiliation, we must speak of the cross. The heart of the Gospel. The cardinal point of Christianity. If you have heard anything about Christianity, hopefully it has been this. The cardinal point of the Christian faith, the heart of it all is this, is the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. That in His grace and His love toward His people, Yet knowing that justice must be served, that the wrath of God must be placated, so in that love, He lays down His life willingly and is beat and spat upon and made a public mockery and nailed to a Roman cross outside of Jerusalem in ancient Israel some 2,000 years ago. The Lord Jesus Christ there upon that cross bore the wrath of God. Something glorious was happening that the eye could not see. There was something much more than just the physical sufferings of Christ that took place there. The wrath of the Father, the infinite, eternal, just wrath of God was unleashed from heaven against Christ. The innocent died as if he was guilty. He was counted as if he was a liar and a thief, as if he was as filthy as you are, as if, he's, as if he was a sinner as you are and as I am. Christ took ownership of the sins of His people. He stood in their place. He stood in my place, in my room, in my stead. And He was spared not. He was not spared upon that cross. I love how the hymn puts it. That on that cross where Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. It was gone. It was put away at the cross. What is hell, my friends? God unleashing His just wrath against the wicked. But what is the cross? God in His grace puts that wrath on His Son instead of His people so that His people could be set free so that they would not be eternally ruined and burned in hell forever. Instead, they would be freed and allowed to enter into glory. 
though they are wretches, though they are vile wretches, they are now made slaves of the Lord Jesus Christ, children of God, co-heirs with Christ. Hallelujah unto God that God has accomplished salvation. The triune God has accomplished salvation by His grace for His glory. So upon the cross, as I said, Jesus satisfied the wrath of God. I love what Isaiah 53 says. Verse 5 says, He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him, and by His scourging we are healed. Isaiah 53 verse 10 says, The Lord was pleased to crush Him. Jesus said on that cross at that moment of His death, to Telestai, that is, it is finished, the wrath of the Father put away, the sin of the people of God paid for, gone, not an ounce of wrath left. That is why the text of Scripture here in Isaiah 53, written 700 years before Jesus was born, says, but the Lord was pleased to crush Him. And praise be to God that Christ did not remain dead, but after three days in the tomb, the Father rose Him up as the public display, the public display that He had received His sacrifice as the sufficient payment for the sins of the people of God. The Father rose Him up to show us that He had received the sacrifice of His Son. That it was enough. See, in the Old Testament, God had instituted the system of animal sacrifice. And we know that from the book of Hebrews that animals could never take away sin. So it was all pointing forward to Christ. It was, it was typological. It was pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. There were only types and shadows of what was to come. And Christ Himself being the substance. And in the Old Testament, if sacrifices were done wrongly, God would not accept them. They had to be done perfectly. Just the way God had commanded. And so Christ comes in as the, the high priest, the great high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And He lays down Himself as the sacrifice. His own body, the sacrifice. And it was so perfect and so pleasing to God that He rose Him up from the grave as the public display that He had received His atoning work upon the cross as sufficient payment. So Christ is alive today and forevermore. Hallelujah unto God. And even not only that, but 40 days later, Christ went to the top of the Mount of Olives there outside of Jerusalem and stood there and bodily ascended into glory. He bodily went into heaven after already completing the work of salvation. That's why Hebrews 1.3 says, He is the radiance of His glory and the exact representation of His nature and upholds all things by the word of His power. When He had made purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And so Christ reigns as Lord and as King of the universe at this present moment. Praise be unto God. And so the call of the Gospel, the call of the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ unto all men is found in Mark. In Mark chapter 1, Jesus says in verse 15, The time is fulfilled and the Kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and and believe in the Gospel. So you must repent and believe. What is repentance? Repentance is a brokenness over sin. A brokenness over the fact that we've offended the God who has given us all the good things that we have enjoyed. And it is a, it's a resolve. It's a resolve to flee sin. To flee pornography. To flee drunkenness. To flee selfishness. To flee pride and hatred and enmity. To flee trying to earn righteousness before God by our own merits. And it is a resolve to flee unto the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is where faith comes in. Repentance and faith are hand in hand. They are, they are twins joined to the hip. Faith, my friends, is confidence in the promises of God. Com pro uh, confidence in the Word of God. As God has revealed promises concerning His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and salvation, the sinner believes it and is saved. Abraham... The father, according to, uh, the father of all believers according to faith, in Genesis 15, 6 it says, Abraham believed in the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. God 
saved Abraham because Abraham believed the Word of God. It's the same way. Salvation has always been the same. There's not this differentiating way of salvation between Old and New Testament. It's always been the same from the beginning of time. Believing in the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. And even in the Old Testament, there was enough light for people to be saved. Genesis 15, 6, we find the first mention of the Gospel. Oh, God bless you, sir. We find the first mention of the good news of Jesus Christ. Genesis 15, 6, God says to the serpent, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and he, and he will crush your head. You shall bruise him on the heel. That is the Gospel. Christ came to destroy the work of Satan. Satan came and deceived the woman, deceived Adam and Eve in the garden, and Adam fell, as I said earlier. We've all fallen in Adam. Christ comes and obliterates the work of Satan. So even though you're a child of the devil, if you're outside of Christ and you're in the kingdom of darkness, the Gospel can transfer you from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God's beloved Son. The, the skull-crushing seed of the woman, the Lord Jesus Christ, a strong, powerful, su sufficient, broad-shouldered Savior. He, you must embrace Him, my friends. He is Lord and there is no other. And for the sinner who repents and believes, the promise of the Gospel is that God will forgive them of all their sin, past, present, and future, because of the work of Christ upon the cross. He will forgive them of all their sin. If you repent and believe, you'll be forgiven of all your sin, past, present, and future. And not only that, but God credits to the sinner the righteousness of His Son, the righteousness of Christ. That is, He credits them with having lived Jesus' life because He credited Christ with having lived their, their life. That's the great exchange of the Gospel. That Jesus takes my sin, Jesus takes my filth, and I receive His perfect righteousness, His perfect performance unto my account. So that when the Father looks at me, He sees Christ. Because when He looked at Christ, He saw me. When He looked at Christ upon that cross, He saw me. Friends, that's the beauty of the Gospel. That God gives righteousness freely. You are either wrapped in the garments of your filthy sin right now, or you're wrapped in the garments of the Lord Jesus Christ, His perfect righteousness. Friends, the Gospel call is that you must repent and believe so that you are forgiven of your sins and given the righteousness of Christ. It is all by God's free grace, not by the works of the law we justify, but by grace. Free, unmerited favor. Grace, 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 my friends. And I want to say this, for the true Christian, for the one who has been truly saved by God's grace, they are given a new nature. They are regenerated. They are recreated. They are born from above, to use scriptural terms. Their desires have now changed. If you say you're a Christian, but you care nothing of the things of God, nothing about holiness, you're not a Christian. You're lost. If you say you know Christ, but you do not live for Christ and you care nothing about the Gospel, you are lost. The one who has been truly saved desires holiness, desires the things of God. They now love the things that God loves and hate the things that God hates. They love the Word of God. They love the fellowship of the saints. They love prayer because they've been made new. They've been born from above. They hate sin. They hate pride and selfishness. They hate lust and sexual immorality. They hate drunkenness because they have been born from above. I don't care what kind of religious experience you've had in the past. I don't care if your parents have told you you're a Christian or your friends tell you you're a Christian or a pastor or a priest or someone else has told you you're a Christian. If you do not bear fruit of conversion, then you are lost. If you do not bear fruit of salvation, you are lost. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 7, Concerning, concerning people, concerning discerning whether someone is a true Christian or not. He says in verse 16, You will know them by their fruits. Verse 20, You will know them by their fruits. Verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. If you want to know whether you know Christ, it is whether you live for Him or not. It's whether your actions are in conformity to the will of God. 
That's how you know whether you've been born from above. I was a hypocrite for eight years, said I was a Christian. I had prayed the prayer and asked Jesus into my heart, quote and unquote. But I was lost. I was lost. Until God truly saved me from my hypocrisy and I was born from above. I was made new. I was recreated. I was made new from above. God had, God had given me a new heart. And friends, you must examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. And if not, then repent and believe the gospel. And if you see, yes, I bear fruit of conversion. I love Christ. Then glory to God. Glory to God indeed. My friends, work is not the cause of salvation. It is the fruit of it. Works of righteousness are not the cause of salvation, but they're the fruit of it. When God saves someone, they now they automatically work for Him. They automatically love, delight in the true God of glory. And they will obey Him. And this Gospel is not only for the lost, but it is for the Christian. To feed upon every day, to rest in. It is their delight. It is their boast. So my brethren, I encourage you to feed upon the Gospel and pro preach it. The Gospel is for Christians to disseminate around the world, to share it with the lost, so that sinners who are outside of Christ might find hope in Him. Friends, if you're outside of Christ, the call of the Gospel is that you embrace Christ today. Otherwise, when you die, it will be too late. There's not a second chance. Every moment, you could say, is a second chance. A chance upon chance upon chance. God is patient with the wicked, giving them time to embrace Christ. Giving them time to repent. So do not waste your time. Make the most of your time, for the days are evil. All by the grace of God. All by God's unmerited favor so that God gets all the glory. Salvation has been so ordered to bring God all the glory. God is jealous for His own glory as He said through Isaiah. God is not for you. He's not for me. He is for His own glory and own praise and honor. God bless you, sir. That is what God is for. He's jealous for His glory. Jealous to bring praise unto His name. Scripture talks about how He has prepared praise for Himself. God does all that He does ultimately to the chief end that He might be glorified in all His dealings. That's why Paul wrote in Romans 11, after he has thoroughly covered the issue of salvation and God's sovereignty over salvation, he says in verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are His judgments and unfathomable His ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who became His counselor? Or who has first given to Him that it might be paid back to Him again? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be the glory forever. Amen. Indeed, to the true God be all glory and praise forever and ever. Friends, if you know not Christ, Please, I beg you to believe upon Christ for eternal life. To run from your sins and run to the Savior. He will not cast you out. And if you say that you know Christ, my challenge is that you would examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. And if you know Him, praise be to God. But if you see that you're a hypocrite, then the call of the Gospel is still the same. You must believe. Truly believe upon Christ. And if you are a child of God, rest in the Gospel, but then go and preach it to the lost. Delight in it every day and share it with others that they might delight in the God of glory. What is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. As the Baptist Catechism question 2 says. So my dear brethren, share the Gospel of the lost by the grace of God for the glory of God. So we have seen here in Romans chapter 3, verse 19, that every mouth is closed before God and every man is without excuse because of our sin. Yes. We are all accountable to God. We deserve hell for our sin because we've broken God's law. But Christ came into the world to live, to die, and to rise again on behalf of sinners to bring about salvation for His people that they might be saved by His grace and for His glory. So to the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal God, be all glory, honor, and praise in all things as they redound to His glory. May He be brought glory forever and ever. Amen and amen.